Welcome back, Colin. This is a completely different day, as you can tell. You know, we didn't shoot this immediately after you shot a review with Mike, which is good because I'm very excited to talk to you today about RoboCop 2. Ugh. I think it's just as good as the first movie, so we're going to go all into it. I can reuse my notes from the Mike review, mm. which is good. Oh, oh, you did it with Mike? Yeah. Why don't we just, uh, we'll reuse that footage from the RoboCop uh, review. Yeah. And just every time you say RoboCop, we'll replace it with Little Shop of Horrors. <laughs> okay. And then we'll just reuse that video Perfect. over and over. It'll be seamless. You can do anything with AI these days. Except have a, a, an amazing practical plant monster with perfect mouth articulation. Uh, CG, that would embarrass <laughs> the hell out of those puppeteers. Now we're here to talk about Little Shop of Horrors. Mm -hmm. Little Shop of Horrors. 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 You got to be horror. careful. Horrors. Best Little Shop of Horrors in <laughs> Texas. Best Little Horror Best Shop little in horror Texas. Horror House in Texas. <laughs> it's like Burt Reynolds and Dolly together again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. This is. Have we. I guess we did Willy Wonka. As I say, I don't think we've done a musical. But no. Willy Wonka, I guess, is a musical. I'm a huge fan of musicals. Mm. Uh, no, like genuinely, I am. So uh, everybody that says that has to repeat it. Too. Exactly. No, I'm not joking. No, seriously, I yeah. am. Um, so, but for some reason, this whole this movie was like a blind spot for me in in my film watching until like this year. Is that right? This year. So that's crazy. I was in Vegas last year playing the penny slots. And I got stuck on this little shop of horrors, like Penny Slot Machine, and it was great. It was like all the music was like really catchy. You get all those songs stuck in your head the rest of the mean trip. Mean Green, Mother from Outer Space, yeah. as you're like winning and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So it was like, yeah, I've like never seen it. And I've always wanted to. I didn't have anything against it, but I just never got around to it. It was one of those movies where I keep forgetting that I haven't seen it. And it's just like, oh yeah, shit, we should watch that tonight. Yeah. Someone someone should have told you sooner that Jim Belushi was in it and you would have been all oh, over it. I would have been it. running right to it. Yeah. Just like, what the Belushi? Excuse me, pardon me, beg your pardon. If you two kids would just stop singing for a moment, I've got something I want to discuss with you. Well, he's in one version of it, which we'll yeah, get into. Which, but, uh, yeah, I had no idea that was the case. But uh, so yeah, I watched it and um, unknowingly watched the director's cut. Uh, the first time. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that two cuts existed, so... Well, they didn't until... I mean, the theatrical cut is all that was available until about a decade ago. Which is um, so they, weird. they remastered and finished uh, the original version of it, and that's what... I don't know which one is more readily available now, like if you were to watch it streaming somewhere. I don't know uh, if you... I don't even remember how I watched it. I think it was on a friend's Plex or something like that. So, okay. uh, But I immediately watched the theatrical uh, ending afterwards. So I kind of got them mixed up in my head, which was which. It's funny because, yeah, I, I, I've seen this movie a million times, uh, the theatrical version, and then it, it seemed fine. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that's a fine ending, I guess. The rest of the movie's great, and then it just has a normal happy ending. And then you watch that director's cut. And, and it's like, the, holy shit. <laughs> well, I mean, well, yeah, we'll talk about the, the differences between the two, but the, uh, the, the cut from the original version of the movie to the reshot ending. Right. It's so jarring when you know about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I knew, so it was just like, ah, whatever. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, I mean, growing up, I watched the theatrical cut, and it just flowed like a movie. But mm -hmm. once, once you're aware of the differences, then it's... Then it st stands out. You can't can't not notice it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is one of those things. It uh, uh, I don't know why, and I'm kicking myself now for not watching it earlier because it was fucking amazing. I was so blown away by this movie. It's it's one of the best musicals. Yeah, it's, it's uh, a movie that annoying theater kids just love. But this movie is a adaptation of a musical, a stage musical, which is an adaptation of an old Roger Corman film. You may have been a crummy dentist, but you were a nice fella. I never meant to kill anybody in my whole life. So there's been a few instances like that. Like there's uh, Hairspray, there's the original oh, okay, movie, and right. then the producers was yep. the Mel Brooks movie, and then it was a stage play, and then it was right. a musical. The problem with the other ones is that they're all so like boring as far as how they're shot. Uh -huh. They're just kind of like flat sitcom looking uh, executions of the stage play. Right, okay. Um, and this movie is not that. It's directed by Yoda, and he does a fantastic <laughs> job. By Miss Piggy. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Oz. Uh, yeah, so he has had an interesting career. Yeah, this was his first... I mean, it's sort of Muppet-related, and that a lot of the Muppet people worked on the Audrey 2 plan, but it's right. his first... He directed uh, 
uh, Muppets Take Manhattan. So this was like maybe his second movie, or he, he co-directed The Dark Crystal. So this oh, is his okay, first right. like uh, step away from strictly Jim Henson Muppety stuff. Right, and he kind of turned this down, I think, first, and then like it went to Spielberg. Mm. Uh, he was originally supposed to direct it, and then he wanted to stay on as executive producer. And then Martin Scorsese was supposed to direct it. Oh my lord! And wanted to shoot it in 3D, <laughs> which I guess maybe in retrospect it would have like gone with the vibe. It's like got the sort of 50s, uh, like corny horror movie vibes. Well, so. that's this is 86. Is that the wave of like Jaws 3D? Is that the same era? Uh, yeah, it's within that whole... Friday the 13th like, 3D. I'm trying to think of like Space Hunter 3D. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. Jaws 3D. Yeah, it would have been around then. Yeah, you have that, that plant jumping out at you. That would have oh, yeah. worked. Especially but it, the... Uh, yeah, the, the style, it's very stylized. It's very yeah. heightened. Um, the intentionally corny acting. Yep. Uh, you have Christopher Guest shows up in a cameo. Oh, and yeah. it's, well, that's an unusual story and a fascinating plant. It's just so funny. It's almost like he's, he's dubbed or something. Right? Yeah. So like, he's saying exactly what they need to hear yeah, at that he's moment. He's like a pod person or yeah. something. <laughs> While I'm here, I might as well take $50 worth of roses. $50? <laughs> it kind of still maintains, it's it's very uh, well shot and well directed. Like it has a lot of style to it. Yeah. Uh, it's still kind of, you're still aware that it is based on a musical. Like it still has that theatrical quality to it which isn't just like shit, shitty like flat copy of what they did on the stage play. Mm -hmm. Like they have those sort of like, there's an artificial like kind of backdrop. Like the set has like an, you know, uh, kind of feel to it that it's all kind of like fake and set like. And it's okay that it's unrealistic because the whole thing is kind of an homage to yeah, 50s sure. B movies. But that set, that main like, the whole movie takes place in and around the plant store. Mm -hmm. So you have not just like a phony backdrop, but there's like a couple layers of it. I don't know if it's forced perspective or what. Because you've probably, got like the, of uh, like the buildings and the, stuff. Yeah, like the that. buildings and there's like a like a tiny L train that goes past. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's probably a miniature, but like even the sky just looks very painted. And yeah. Like, you know what I mean? They they know it's like it, a very it's, it's completely choice. appropriate uh, for what the movie is kind of paying homage to. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not trying to make you think this is a real. It's similar to like uh, a couple things about it. it reminded me of Gremlins because that's all shot in a back lot. Okay, yeah. It's not really trying to hide it that it's a back lot. Like Gremlins is sort of like a Frank Capra movie run yeah. amok by little monsters. It kind of like fits the tone yeah. of what they're going for. But even like the acting style, I think, is like you know when they're talking and they come up to camera and just sort of look up into the sky and say, I wish, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, I mean, they're like talking to the audience and all this sort of stuff. So it, it still maintains that kind of vibe of like a, a musical, like mm. a stage performance, but uh, very stylishly directed and it looks really, really good. On the 23rd day of the month of September. Right, right off the bat, because there's the uh, like opening crawl, mm -hmm. um, which has like this cartoony green font to it. And it looks like the background to it is like outer space, mm -hmm. but then we dissolve to just like it's just like a like scum water. It's not <laughs> outer space. It's just like a filthy pond on yeah. this uh, disgusting street in Skid Row. Skid Row. And the whole movie and the music's so poppy, and there's that like contrast to all that. Like the uh, it's it's really dark. Mm -hmm. A lot of the subject matter is really dark. Yeah. But it's played with this like. Uh, optimistic, like heightened kind of reality. Yeah, it's like that 50s cornball. Poor, all my life I've always been poor. But yeah, you're talking about like, uh, you know, Audrey, the character of this movie, it's uh, Ellen Green. Yes. Uh, she's getting like beaten by her boyfriend. She's got a shiner. How'd you get that shiner? I know it's none of my business, but I'm beginning to think he's maybe not such a nice boy. The movie's basically about two different people that are both in abusive relationships. Yeah. Because we have Audrey and her boyfriend, played by uh, unknown actor. I don't know who that man was. Uh, oh, the dentist the guy? The dentist guy. I've seen him in stuff before, he, but... He's the worst part of the movie. Uh, a... But then you have Rick Moranis, uh, who is uh, in an abusive relationship with the giant talking plant. Uh, he's great. He's born to play this role, I think. He's so, he's such like a nebbish, like kind of nerd. It's it's the ultimate uh, Rick Moranis performance. Yeah. It's everything you want out of Rick Moranis. And he's front and center. Because uh, he didn't play the lead in a lot of stuff. He's always like the comic sidekick. And yeah, maybe like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids Honey, or I something. Shrunk the Kids, which came out a few years later. He's always this sort of character. The only time I've seen him kind of stray for this from this uh, type of character is like Streets of Fire, where he plays this like, asshole yeah it's like this abusive asshole like i don't know this is like fast talking wise ass let me tell you something these clothes are worth more than you make in a year but uh yeah he usually kind of gravitates towards these type of roles i think mm -hmm. uh, uh he can sing he's a good singer too 
Um, you know, he showed that on SETV a lot. <laughs> so I don't know. He sort of like just fits in this role perfectly. Yeah, and he's um, opposite Ellen Green, who's the only holdover from the stage production. Right. And they could not have found like the, of course she they brought her onto this because she's absolutely perfect. Yeah. She's doing that voice, that that breathy like cartoony voice. Yes, Seymour, but I could help you pick things out. You could. Sure. And the, the hard part is she has to sing in that voice, and yeah. she just nails it. Like yeah. She's got a great voice, but she's doing it on top of this cartoon accent that she's doing. Yeah, it's very, like, cartoonish, but she's so, I don't know, she's very sweet and, like, innocent, but she's, you know, lived her whole life in these terrible relationships, mm -hmm. um, which we'll get to, but, uh, yeah, uh, she's she has perfect. No, has no self-worth. Yeah, um, she's like a, like a doormat for these, like, abusive scumbag boyfriends that she always seems to gravitate towards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's, like, this sort of gross grossness to the whole, you know, thing, but it's just done in such a poppy, uh, fun way that it's just sort of, I don't know, you just kind of gloss over it. Well, the, yeah, I mean, the contrast is laid out from the opening song where they're talking about living in Skid Row, and it's just this, oh, like, a great song. poppy song, but it's like, oh, this place is a dump and everybody's miserable. Yeah. That's what the song is about. <laughs> and the whole movie, like, starts, we've got the three, it's like the Greek chorus, I guess. Yeah. It's like, you know, the sort of backup singers, like Diana Ross, like the Supremes or something. Mm -hmm. It's like Tisha Campbell, I think, is there from Martin. She, uh, two of them, her and one of the other ones, both went on to be on the TV show Martin. Tashina Arnold is okay. the other one. Uh, I think one was the neighbor, one was Martin's wife or yeah, something like Tisha that. Yeah, Tisha Campbell was Martin Lawrence's wife on that show. Yeah, and I think she was in like House Party as well. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, which is really fun. But they're great, and they always like show up. They're kind of explaining to the audience, like very specifically, of like what the plot's going on, and they they sort of like lead the songs. That Skid Row song is great. It's kind of like worried how the hell we were going to talk about a musical <laughs> with like YouTube going on, like without getting flagged. Like, are you going to show like clips? We'll just replace all the music with like like people playing recorders, like a, like a high school classroom <laughs> version of the song. People are gonna watch it like, what the fuck are they talking about? This is terrible. We'll just mute everything. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I've given you. Well, the one song I, I I'll have to figure out how to edit it in because uh, uh, Audrey has the song about like you know wanting more, the classic part of the movie musical where. Mm -hmm. Sings about wanting more, and I was in rewatching it. I was like, "This sounds like the Little Mermaid song." And then it's, it's because part of this world. It's, it's the part of this world because it's Alan Menken who did the music for Little Mermaid. Yeah. Also did this, so he's just ripping off himself. I dream we'll go out of the sea somewhere. Uh, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, mm. uh, who were responsible for the whole resurgence of like Disney with The Little Mermaid, yeah, they did uh, all Beauty that and the stuff. Beast. Mm -hmm. So it's like their lyrics and music really kind of like, yeah, it's, it's just fantastic. Like the songs are really, really good, very catchy. And then you've got Levi Stubbs from The Four Tops doing the voice of Audrey too, which is again, is perfect. Mm -hmm. like he's, oh my God, just the speaking voice is great. Feed me, crab on, feed me now. Oh, I can't. I'm starving! Do they have on that machine, like, where you put the coins in? Do they, does it say, like, feed me? Feed me, Simo. Oh, it should have. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there was, like, a button or something, or if you want to put, like, more money in or something. But, uh, yeah, but when you're, like, hit the jackpot and you win, like, 15 cents, it was, like, the Mean Green Mother from Outer Space song. Yeah, it was the so one catchy. song that's, uh, the movie kind of closes with that, and that's not in the original stage production. Oh, that song. really? They added it because they wanted to get a nomination for best original song. Yeah. So they threw this other song in, and it's a good song, but it does stand out from the rest of them. Okay, it's catchy. Because I, like... I always remember this movie being more like, no, no, it's a good song, uh -huh. but uh, I always remember the movie being like more crass than it is. Okay. I mean, I think it's just like Levi Stubbs' attitude and his yeah. performance. But that song has a little bit of swearing. You can keep the bang, hey. keep the it, keep the creature, they don't mean shit. I think he says shit in it. Yeah, and it's so it's like it, it feels like they, they wanted to like give the movie a little bit more of an edge than the yeah. I don't know, the typical stage production songs. It's you just to be surprised. Well, I mean the stage production it wasn't I think it was like off Broadway or something like that. It was Yeah, like it was off Broadway thing. and it was I think they can get away with like sassier stuff, you know. It's like Hamilton or something. Yeah. You know. 
And the movie does have a satirical edge to it too, where that song, her her part of your world song, mm -hmm. it's like somewhere that's green, I think is the song. Yeah, so she's, she's imagining like her life with Seymour. It's very yeah, she's looking through like a like a better homes magazine and yeah. fantasizing about having like a nice toaster and <laughs> it's it's very like like I don't know, satirical, like old school kind of like classic values of a yeah. the typical American family. White picket fence, and you've got the two kids that look identical to them, and it's like, you know, <laughs> this is going to be their life. Because she's like never had anything good in her yeah. life, pretty much. She's had this like terrible childhood. Our boyfriends are like assholes. But that, that, that beauty shot of the toaster, she's just like showing it <laughs> off. Like. So yeah, Seymour is like, he's an orphan who works at Mr. Mushnik's flower store. There's more of that in the stage version. Okay, have um, you seen the, you've seen the stage version? I, I, I've seen clips of it and I know about it, I've read about it. Okay. Um, but the, yeah, Mr. Mushnik uh, like basically adopted Seymour as a okay. little kid. He kind of like lives in the basement. To, to, yeah, basically to control him, like to have someone that would run the store for him and uh, stuff like okay. that. Um, and they mentioned something about him in the movie where he says something about Mr. Mushnik let me you know, live here when I was a boy or something like it's that. It's in one of his songs, I think. Yeah, it's it's not as uh, prominent as it is in the stage production. Uh, Mr. Mushnik played by Vincent Gardenia. Would I know him from anything? He's great in the part. Gardenia? I guess originally... Who else um, is going to run a, a flower store? <laughs> that's it's true, Vincent yeah. Gardenia. <laughs> uh, originally, they wanted John Candy for that part, who oh, has a cameo really? later in the movie. And love John Candy, but I think having someone a little bit older... Uh, works better for that part. Oh, than, for sure, than John definitely. Candy yeah, it'd be been. weird if like John Candy adopted like Rick Moranis, <laughs> and, like living in his basement to be I like. Mean, that's a movie. Kind a of like under, movie altogether. Yeah, that's like undertones of like something I don't want to get into. <laughs> no, John Candy works better as like the radio DJ. I think later on. Say, I wish you folks at home could see this. Seymour, where did you get such a weird plant? Not my, not my favorite John Candy cameo hey, in the history of movies, but uh, that of course good. belongs to Home Alone. Uh, I do love the scene where Seymour goes to the radio station and it's like John Candy and he's got uh, Audrey 2 in his lap and then they just sort of pan across the room. It's all these like crazies. There's like a steampunk grandpa for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but he's in this like old timey like flying flight suit and he's mm. got this like, contraption. Wait, Wilkinson laughing and scratching at you. How's everybody doing today? I got a little bit of a stiff neck. Let me just fix this up. I guess that's why it's not my favorite John Candy cameo because he's being unintentional or he's being intentionally, intentionally funny. unfunny. Yeah. And that's just not as good as him like talking about leaving his kid in a in a mortuary with a corpse all day, which oh, is God. When he talks about no blown with Catherine O'Hara. But he's okay. You know, they get over it. Kids are resilient like that. Maybe we shouldn't talk about this. Well, you brought it up. I was just, you know, trying well, to cheer I'm you up. Sorry, I did. That was all like that was all like riff. He was riffing there. It's like improv, wasn't it? Yeah, that whole scene. And yeah. then because him and uh, Catherine O'Hara go back to the SCTV days, so she knew how to play off him. Oh, him yeah. In the back of that great. truck with uh, another SC. The SCTV actors Catherine are all over the place. They're here, everywhere. But... They're like spores that have like spread from Canada, gone all over the place. Which is why I was I was wondering, because there's, the there's the original ending and then the, the theatrical ending. Mm -hmm. In the theatrical ending, Jim Belushi shows up and he's like, hey, we want to franchise this. We want to take clippings of the plant and sell them and they'll be everywhere. In the director's cut, it's Paul Dooley playing basically that same part. And so when I was re watching both versions of it for this, I was like, why didn't they just get Joe Flaherty for this part? <laughs> That's like the perfect Joe yeah, Flaherty that role. Good. <laughs> I've got something for you. A letter. But it's like Paul Dooley in the theatrical, uh, it's like an offer. So like Jim Belushi says like, hey, can we take clippings and then see more it's just like, fuck it, I'm just going to kill Audrey. That, that's his motivation to, oh, it's going to keep getting bigger. This is what it wants. Yeah. I have to stop this. We'll keep eating, eating and eating until there's nothing left. we got to stop it, Seymour. we got to. I've got to. So in the, in the uh, director's cut, which I think works much, much better, uh, especially for the time period when it was released, it's like they've already taken clippings, mm -hmm. and it's already set in motion. Like, this thing is like selling like Cabbage Patch Kids. Yeah, you yeah, see, like, we see a little montage like, of them being pulled off the shelves. And... Yeah, it's like a Black Friday sale or something <laughs> like that, and people are stomping on each other, and, <laughs> you know, fighting, which actually did happen for like Cabbage Patch Kids. Oh, sure, yeah. Potential buyers are not above elbowing, shouting, and crying so they can walk away with their coveted prize. Imagine it, boy, we can make a fortune. Little Audrey 2s everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. This can be bigger than a hula hoop. 
other cameos in the film. Steve Martin is more than a cameo. Is he say like, I think it says like guest appearance or something in I the opening so, credits. I think so, yeah, but But he's, he's, a, he's a big shit. part of the first act. Yeah, big um, time. When he shows up, <laughs> holy shit. I like just started laughing immediately because he's playing so against type mm -hmm. uh, for Steve Martin. <laughs> he's playing this like, cool uh, greaser biker guy. But he's playing it in it, that Steve Martin way where it's kind of sarcastic. It is. Um, I mean, it's so, yeah, it's obviously intentionally over the top. We see him ride his motorcycle and it's he's very like, clearly a, a rear projection or green screen or something. Yeah, I think it's miniatures actually from the end sequence. Oh, Yeah, so okay. I was like, I'd have to rewatch it, that would make sense. But. Yeah, there's an exact shot, I think, with uh, the Audrey 2 things like overtaking the city, and oh, I think it's a, it's a miniature shot of New York, but just his facial expressions. He's playing it up. <laughs> He's such a scumbag in this movie, <laughs> and he could easily like fall into like this disturbing territory where he's like beating up Audrey in this movie. Like, and seeing, he's like, beating up because he's a dentist mm -hmm. and he has like his assistant and he's like, just, we see him just punch her right in the face. As soon as he comes into the, <laughs> the, the door, he like gives her a shot in the face and this great song, but his, his fucking intro is so funny. Yeah, it's like he's trying to like be cool, but you can tell he's like, he's almost trying to like hide a smile yeah. because he knows he's like, okay, I'm Steve Martin. It's like, whatever. <laughs> These uh, magical powers over his motorcycle, or he just points at it and it stops moving. Points at it. I don't know if it's like he's so in control and so cool that he can like jump off of his motorcycle and then just sort of make it stop with like a flick of his head. He's like Elvis or something. The, the part I didn't really remember that made me laugh so hard on this rewatch is uh, I think it's Seymour and uh, Audrey are in the alley mm -hmm. and she's waiting for him to show up and his motorcycle just descends from the sky. <laughs> in the most awkward and unrealistic way possible. <laughs> you hear him like screaming or something because he's like addicted to like nitrous oxide. <laughs> so you hear him like Wee! <laughs> he just sort of lands. He's like too cool for school. Yeah, yeah he's a horrible person. It's like in, in, at one point, it's like he's coming back from a date with Audrey. And he just pulls up alone on his motorbike and she's running down the street after him. Like he's, he's like, ah, I'm just going to like drive away on you. And she's trying to catch up with him. And he's like, come on. It's, it's the kind of thing or if like the, it wasn't shot the way it was and Steve Martin's performance was, wasn't as ridiculous as yeah. it was, it could very easily just not work. Because yeah, tonally it would not fit into the movie yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. He, he does it perfectly, and I was just howling laughing. Like, that's the scene. I've seen clips of it over the years, like, and it's like, okay. And I didn't know how big of a role he had in the movie, but mm -hmm. this whole, his whole intro is fantastic. Just, like, the timing and, like, uh, the choreography, of, like, you know, putting his, like, knee into the person's chest. Yeah. And Sound me a dentist. You'll be a success. Well, also related to the Steve Martin, I guess, extended cameo, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, uh, we get an appearance by Bill Murray. Right. So at the top of his game era, Bill Murray in a very bizarre homoerotic pain fetish. He's like a, yeah, scene. he's like a masochist or something. He loves the pain. Say ah. Uh. But didn't he, uh, he was played by Jack Nicholson in the original. Uh, yeah, in the original movie that was, I don't, I think it was Jack Nicholson's first movie, but it's an early one. One he of used them, because he started with, with Roger Corman, yeah. yeah. Now, no Novocaine, it dulls the senses. <laughs> this is gonna hurt you more than it is me. Oh, goody, goody, here it comes. Uh, yeah, this is just a bizarre scene, but it's really funny. It's so, I mean, there's a shot, because yeah, he, he wants to have pain inflicted on him. Yeah. There's a part a girl comes out of the room and she has this giant headset on and that's Jim Henson's daughter. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, she can't talk, but he's, he can understand what she's saying. Yeah. It's like a Chewbacca situation. She's just like speaking. Well, they have to do that to remove the jaw. Ah, consider yourself very, very lucky. But he, lo I love how like defeated Steve Martin is because he's like, like the sadist. And he loves yeah, like inflicting he pain. He loves inflicting pain, and he mm. hates that like Bill Murray loves it. And he's just like, oh, and he's all like sweating, and but he's the, getting out all these like old timey tools, like the crank drill. And uh, apparently, and I'll do a side by side. Mm -hmm. uh, he opens a drawer, and you see all these tools. Yeah, it's apparently all those tools were reused in uh, Tim Burton's Batman. When the Joker is first, you Get know, the, out of town. Yeah, with Jack Nicholson. With Jack Nicholson. So weird. Weirdly enough, but there's a shot. 
where, yeah, Steve Martin's over him. All you see, I think, are like Bill Murray's eyes because his, uh, his face is covered by Steve Martin's shoulder. Uh -huh. But he has like his hands on his back. It's, it looks like a, like a love scene. <laughs> it's like they're fucking. It's such a weird, like, I mean, I mean, I guess it's directly from the original movie, but yeah. the whole concept is just so bizarre. This guy with this pain fetish going to see a dentist because he wants to be tortured. <laughs> yeah, but I love that whole scene, and uh, uh, Bill Murray, I think, was just, like, improv -ing. They just, like, let him go. Oh, Which I'm I guess it's, sure, like, when you yeah. get Bill Murray, it's just like, ah, fuck it, uh, mm -hmm. this riff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good scene. And I was thinking about that and rewatching it. I was like, I think that's the only time Bill Murray and Steve Martin have ever acted How together. How you say that? I can't remember anything they've been in Yeah, it seems like they would have, but I can't think of anything. Well, and it has that amazing shot where we get the oversized mouth cam. Oh, and, right. And they're doing forced perspective because yeah. he's got the, the drill. So I'm assuming if you actually looked at that prop, it would get larger it's like gigantic, as it goes along. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just the, the giant uh, puppet mouth that they had to create for just that one shot. It's great. It's just, <laughs> it's just a good stylistic touch. And I think that's what Frank Oz kind of brings to this. Yeah. I'm not really familiar with a lot of his other movies other than... None of them are as stylized as this. No. He did like Bowfinger. He worked with Steve Martin on a number of oh, things. Oh, yeah. But, but I think he fits perfectly for this movie because he's like, he's directing like a big puppet. And well, this... that's, yeah. I was thinking it, during the end musical number, the Mean Mother from Outer Space, we have all the yeah. little uh, ones and they pop up and they sing in unison. It's very like Muppet. Yeah, it's, it's like... great though. <laughs> now we have to talk about this puppet because it is so, I might blew my fucking mind when I first saw this. Mm -hmm. Like I had no idea how good it could be at this time. Like the, the articulation of... In the mouth, like yeah. when it's enunciating words and stuff. But I think that it was the speed at which it moves, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that they used... They, I think they shot it at 16 frames a second. They, there's, they did 16, and then when it was even larger, I think they did 12 frames a second. Okay. So and that they, they could uh, have more time to make the facial movements yeah, change. Yeah, and then they speed it up. They play it back at 24, and you're just not, you can't believe that something this large is moving so quickly mm -hmm. and perfectly and, you know, enunciating these words. I've never seen it done before. You don't know what And just uh, the, the detail of the design too, mm -hmm. like the lips and all the little veins that are all over it. It's fantastic. And even like the, the inside of the mouth when it opens up and it's got all that kind of like the designs and it looks, looks so wet and <laughs> gross. Uh, it, it grows and changes too. At one point yeah. the inside of the mouth is all like purple. Earlier in the movie it's not and it looks a little more I don't know, kind of vaginal, I guess. It's yeah, so it's, but it's upsetting, it's but so well done, and it just blew my mind. And it's sort of a testament to how good the effects are pulled off in the movie that I couldn't figure out how the hell they were doing it mm -hmm. uh, from shot to shot. I'm just like, is this a miniature? Is this like a forced perspective? Is this well? There's a shot early way? on. I, I think it's after Seymour uh, first uh, feeds him like a little finger of blood, where you see it growing through the Maxwell House. Camera. Yeah, in the shot, and I assumed it was like. Maybe they shot that. It's an optical or something. It was all done in camera, though. They had the actual plants on like a, a sliding rig, so it would get closer to camera. Okay. As it got, so it looked like it was getting bigger. But, but it's, then the Maxwell House can didn't change, so that would have been in front of it. I, I don't know. It's I, I know they did it all in camera because yeah, in the director's cut, there's only like two optical shots, and they're at the end okay. when they're incorporating like real people with the oversized. Uh, plants attacking the city. But it's just so clever. They use like every single trick in the book to mm -hmm. kind of like fool you. And they're always keeping you on your toes from like cut to cut. And it's just like, you can't. And the, and the fact that they took the time to have some of those shots that were shot in like 12 frames a second or 16 frames where Seymour, Rick Moranis is like interacting with it, which means he had to act <laughs> yeah. in slow motion too. And you, oh my it's God. completely seamless. You yeah, and he's that. singing too. So uh, yeah. it, it, you can see it in certain shots. There's like a couple where he kind of, I don't know, gets pulled to, to Audrey too. And you can tell, okay, he's like sped up a little bit, but it's seamless otherwise. And it's so fucking good. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, it just blew my mind. It's very tricky to get animatronics to really enunciate uh, words, mm -hmm. especially like in real time. So and I think it was just an accident. It was like this Henson puppeteer, I think that uh, uh, Frank Oz had worked with on Dark Crystal and mm. one of the Manhattan. And he said he was like watching something like clips like sped up and it just sort of hit differently. And he was like, mm. holy shit. <laughs> 
we have to try this out. And then Frank Oz is like, fine, but you have to plead your case to the actors because they're the <laughs> ones who are going to have to like have to act in slow motion. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot more work, but holy shit, does and, it pay and off. And it holds on a lot of those shots for a while too. A long time. It's not just yeah. like, oh, here's a quick one, and then we cut to a reaction shot of someone else. Yeah. Like it's just yeah, big wide shots with uh, Rick Moranis walking around in front of it. Mm -hmm. Like they really take their time with. Yeah, this uh, is high quality stuff, and I didn't know this. You know, animatronics were at this level in 1986, and I haven't really seen it since uh, or before. So I don't know. It got nominated for an Oscar, um, and it lost to Aliens, which is fair. It's, okay, <laughs> uh, I'm thinking, uh, if it lost to anything else, and I'm like, Aliens, fuck. Yeah, okay, that's that's fair. I'd be happy with either of them, like, you know, getting an Oscar. Mm. I was just thinking it's appropriate that it got nominated for some Oscars, because, you know, Frank Oz worked with the Muppets, so. So Audrey two. Uh, he named the plant after Audrey One, mm -hmm. Ellen Green's character. Uh, it's an alien, which I kind of had forgotten. He gets he has his musical number early on. It's like on. a doo-wop song. Early yeah, on. and he's talking about, I went past the old Chinese uh, flower shop, and I was waiting for it. Again, like Gremlins, you know, he goes to Chinatown, and that's where he finds Gizmo. So it's like, is this going to be that, like, the, the, the mystical Asian stereotype thing? But, but it's then, not. But then it's not. It's like a subversion of that. It's, it's like a <laughs> random, like, lightning strike. But I think they're, they're playing on the radio, and I think you see maybe some newspaper headlines that uh, something is going on. There's some, I don't know, some atmospheric anomaly or mm. something like that. And you just see it, like, get struck by lightning. It's just a regular old plant that yeah. gets struck by lightning and just mutates. <laughs> and he sells it to him for, I don't know, like a couple bucks or something, or buck 99 or yeah. whatever. Um, yeah, and then you get into this, so it's just growing bigger and bigger, and he's not a murderer. He goes into to murder Steve Martin uh, in a really good song where, like, Audrey is, like, convincing him. Like, it's to, the Feed Me Seymour song. Yeah, which yeah. is fantastic. And uh, so he goes to kill Steve Martin, and then Steve Martin, like, is addicted to, like, nitrous oxide, and then wears <laughs> this mask, puts this mask on, and, like, ends up, like, asphyxi uh, ends up asphyxiating by, his, by himself. <laughs> Oh, Jesus! <laughs> I'm in trouble now, huh? Well, that's that's the, the smart way to do it, uh, yeah. to keep your, your protagonist likable. Kind of innocent. Yeah, he, he, he thinks about killing him, but then he can't do it, and then just through happenstance, he's there at the right time where Steve Martin accidentally kills himself. Um, so then the end. Okay, here we diverge. Uh, well, this is leading up to that. This is where there's, there's little changes from the play, but they kind of add up. Because um, people, yeah, now people talk about like the theatrical cut ending versus the director's cut ending. Uh, I like a dark ending, and I think uh, from a technical standpoint, this ending is amazing. Um, but one thing that the stage version does is, yeah, the Steve Martin death is similar, where it, it's kind of an accident. Mm -hmm. And then the next person he feeds to uh, Audrey is Mr. Mushnick. Mushnick. Who, who I think witnessed him like chopping up Steve Martin. In the, the movie, he does. Okay. In the stage play, he kind of puts the pieces together. I get you. And he becomes slightly more sympathetic. He doesn't point a gun at, uh, at Seymour like he does in the movie. Mm -hmm. He's much more like menacing in the movie. So it's a similar situation to the Steve Martin death where it's like, oh, it, he's, uh, Seymour's kind of backed into a corner. And yeah, he wants to take the plant. He says, like, I'll, you know, I saw what you did, so I won't, yeah. I won't tell the cops, but just give me the plant because it's the, like a money-making machine. Right, and the stage play, he's more concerned with just making sure that Seymour gets caught for okay. having this person killed. So uh, Seymour has more agency in killing Mr. Mushnick, mm -hmm. and that's kind of his turn into being a darker character in the stage play. Got it. So when you get to that dark ending of it the stage kind of, play, it, it, it's... it's feels like it fits. It feels like it fits, yeah. It feels more like, oh, well, this is his comeuppance for being corrupted because the whole idea is the plant gets bigger. He starts to think about, like, fame and fortune. And the movie keeps him more innocent the whole way through. Mm -hmm. So I can see why what happened is the, the, the uh, director's cut, um, Audrey get, starts to get eaten by the plant. He pulls her out. She's dying. And he says, uh, she says to him, feed me to the plants so that you can go on to live a happy life and make money from it. I'll always be like a, a part of you or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's like a, like a, uh, a self-sacrifice kind of thing. Yeah. When I die, give me to the plant so that I will live and bring you all the wonderful things you deserve. And so he feeds her the plant and then he has the agency to try and kill Audrey, or right. Audrey too. In the stage play, he has like a axe or a machete or something, mm -hmm. and it's sort of like I'm going to kill you or I'm going to die trying. So that's sort of his like 
attempt to redeem himself. And this, the uh, movie version is more, he's just like an innocent the whole way through. Right. So until when you get meets, to that until ending. Until he meets Jim Belushi. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I've got to fucking kill this thing. So, so I can see, they, they, famously, they had test screenings, and mm -hmm. uh, Audrey dies, Seymour dies, and the plants take over the world. Yeah. And audiences are like, this is depressing. This is not that's, appropriate. That's the, audio, that's the ending I would have gone with. I, I th but I think <laughs> making uh, Seymour so sympathetic the whole way through that yeah. it does have a different effect than it would if he kind of like turn darker like he does in the stage play. Yeah, if he sort of had more agency, kind of killing Mr. Mushnick or something like that. Cause yeah, Mushnick, well that's, that's the way it is in the play. Mushnick, yeah, he takes that turn when he pull, pulls the gun out and then Seymour is kind of like giving in and saying like, here's how you take it. And he's sort of backing up yeah. and then Audrey 2. There's, there's a little bit of him like helping Audrey 2 eat him, but yeah. it's not as uh, prominent He's not as, as directly play. involved with yeah. it. Uh, so yeah, I get I get what you mean, but you know from but for me for my sensibilities <laughs> like every, yes that oh yeah it's a minor complaint because everything else about this director's cut ending is the most amazing thing you've never seen. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> fantastic. Nobody did see it for and a it goes time. on and on and on, and it's like this is Richard Conway. He was a guy that uh, I think Frank Oz knew. He did miniatures for Brazil. Yeah, which looks very similar to this at the end. Yeah, but uh, this whole sequence is just fantastic. It's just, it's amazing. And I don't know how many millions they spent doing it. It was a fifth of the movie's budget. <laughs> Holy and shit. And then they watched it in test screenings and just said, throw it all in the trash. Oh, <laughs> can you imagine as like a puppeteer and a miniature guy, like after all that work? Yeah. Well, I was thinking about it. There's a way to, they could have had their cake and eaten it too. Yeah. Where they could incorporate all this amazing effects work and these uh, plants taking over the world. There's some great visual gags too, like mm -hmm. the, the L train that just goes right into the oh, plant's yeah. mouth. <laughs> um, but you do your reshoot ending. The reshoot ending is they go out into the, uh, Audrey's being eaten, Seymour saves her. They go out into the alley. She falls to the ground for one second and then it hard cuts to the new footage where she stands up and she's fine. Yeah. Audrey, Audrey. Uh, no, uh, I'm okay. <laughs> Her best acting is in that director's cut scene where she's saying, "Feed me to to the plan." Finally, I'll be somewhere green. Or yeah, something like that. yeah. Like, it's like dream. tragic. It's great. I know um, it's sad, but it like kind of it's like yeah, it all kind of works out how it should because like this all this like death and destruction. Yeah. Um. So it, it feels weird having that that tacked on ending in retrospect. With, right. But yeah, I would have gone. But just from a technical standpoint, like what you're saying, it's just an amazing watch. But yeah. So what they could have done is uh, Jim Belushi shows up mm -hmm. and he he explains the idea of you know franchising this thing. And uh, Rick Moranis has that moment where he's he's like, oh, I, this is what the plants wanted all along. It wants to take over the world. You have him look up and you do the doodly do dissolves. Okay, so it's And you like, have a fantasy scene <laughs> yeah, okay. of all the plants taking over the world. And you could use all these amazing shots and all this great puppetry and effects work. Like and it. then you doodly do back to reality and you show that slapped on shot where he electrocutes the thing and it blows up. Yeah, that could work. It's maybe a bit too long, but... It would be a it would be a fun joke. It's fine. Yeah, it's like twenty plus minutes <laughs> flat, and then you the flashback. I, I will say that that as amazing as that ending is, the director's cut ending, it does feel a little self indulgent. Yeah, because it just keeps it keeps going. going and going and going. It's like fuck it if you got the money. But it does feel like I mean the movie was building towards that. The mm -hmm. plant's getting bigger and bigger, and it's kind of nice at the end to really open it up because we've been in this one kind of set for most of the movie. Yeah. Um, so having it open up like and, and turn into just like a full blown 50s B movie, basically. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. Um, it's just amazing. Yeah. So much destruction. They end up like on the Statue of Liberty and like the. Well, that's the, 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 the end. Question mark. They did it. Ah!